Hi, my name is Dr. Fox. I'm a licensed psychologist in the state of Texas. In this video, we're going to talk about BPD, gender patterns, and I'm also going to give you three strategies to help manage some of those issues and decrease some of those issues and problems that come up for individuals with borderline personality disorder. So BPD is easily one of the most misunderstood disorders. There's a host of reasons for this, and I will get into some of those in just a moment, but in this video, I'll confront some of the most confusing issues, and then I'm going to present three easily implemented strategies to help you work more effectively and efficiently with those BPD issues that keep coming up and causing problems. So let's get to it. So as for prevalence, earlier research concluded that the higher proportion of women than men are diagnosed with BPD. Now, this is research from two decades ago, right? While more recent research has demonstrated no differences in prevalence by gender. But researchers have established differences in prevalence rates of BPD across different genders in the past, right? We know that. I just said that, right? But none of them have determined the extent to which they authenticate those gender imbalances. And they have not been able to demonstrate whether these biases affect clinical outcomes. These gaps have and do adversely affect the quality of care individuals with BPD receive. So let's break it down even further. The ratio of females to males with the disorder is greater in clinical populations than it is in the general population. Now the ratio is three to one in clinical settings. However, two epidemiologic surveys in the United States that looked at general population found the lifetime prevalence of BPD does not differ significantly between men and women. This discrepancy suggests that women with BPD are more likely to seek treatment than men. But let's also talk about those gender patterns and trait evidence that further complicate this complicated picture. It is a complicated disorder. So current evidence indicates that there are notable gender differences in BPD with regard to personality traits, comorbidity, and treatment utilization. In a study of patients with BPD, men and women were found to have similar rates of childhood trauma and levels of current psychosocial functioning, so they function equally. Men with BPD are more likely to demonstrate an explosive temperament and a higher level of novelty seeking than women with BPD. Men with BPD are more likely than women to evidence antisocial personality disorder and trend toward higher rates of narcissistic, paranoid, and schizotypal personality disorders. Men with BPD are more likely to have substance abuse disorders, whereas women with BPD are more likely to have eating, mood, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorders. Men with BPD are more likely to have treatment histories relating to substance abuse, whereas women are more likely to have treatment histories characterized by more pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy. Now there's a trend toward higher maximum lethality of suicide attempts in men suicide attempters compared with women suicide attempters. But there is no difference between men and women with regard to proportion of suicide attempters or the number of suicide attempts. So what does all this mean? Well, men with BPD are more impaired and may be at higher risk of dying by suicide compared to women with BPD. And we need to know and use up-to-date information to make our diagnostic determinations that help guide treatment. It is so important. In many cases, based upon the information that I just gave you, in many instances, men that would actually qualify for BPD are misdiagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Now, in many cases, women with antisocial personality disorder are inappropriately and misdiagnosed with BPD.
So we have to keep an eye out for these things, right? Borderline personality disorder is a distinctly different disorder than antisocial personality disorder. We have to be aware that doesn't mean there may not be some morbidity components, because there certainly can be, but they are distinctively two different disorders. And I think we need to be aware of what the prevalences are and what the issues are, as well as based upon the clients that we have or the individuals who may be watching this video, that the individuals that we're working with that are functioning with BPD, that gender plays a particular part in sort of the evidence of different traits, the evidence of different behaviors. And we have to be aware of that. So let's talk about treatment, right? What can providers do? What can individuals with BPD do, right, if they have this disorder? So what are some things that can be really helpful? So I'm gonna give you three great tips, techniques to help you out. The first one, right, this one is really great. So I got my cup here, and it's got some ice cubes in it. Now what happens is, of course, is that there are activating events so an individual with BPD has an activating event. It could be a sense of rejection. It could be a sense of abandonment. They have the sense of emptiness, loss, fear, doubt, hope, shame, guilt, whatever it may be. And this starts to spiral and intensify, which drives that individual right to typically act on urges. So what I do with a lot of my clients is that I have them get a little ice cube, right? That's what I got here, okay? And sometimes I'll have them hold it and they'll breathe and focus. Focus on the cold of the, uh, it, and it's cold. Focus on the cold of the ice cube. Feel it. I feel how it's melting, right? I feel that it's dripping. I feel how cold it is. Sometimes for clients that get really, really agitated and really, really worked up, I'll ask them just to rub it kind of on their forehead a little bit, <laughs> excuse me, right? Just rub it on the forehead and relax and refocus. Now, interestingly, that <laughs> the body has a physiological reaction to that, to that cold. And we find that in many ways that it is somewhat of a shock to the system, a reorientation right, of their attention. So instead of getting lost in that activating event and that urge, that ice cold helps them reorient it, refocus. And that's an opportunity to use adaptive and healthy strategies as opposed to those old maladaptive and unhealthy strategies. The next one that I have for you now, it's not uh, as experiential as the one that I just showed you. I'm going to put my cup down. Um, but it's a routine, having a routine. It is so critical for individuals with BPD to have a routine. Now, um, a lot of times work can be great because it requires that individual to get up at a particular time, go to a particular place, do a particular thing. It adds that sense of routine. Many individuals with uh, BPD, in, in my experience, hate routine, right? They find it boring. They find that it's, it loses this sense of, of stimulation, of interest, things like that. But that routine is so important. How specific does that routine need to be? That's up to the client and what makes them feel comfortable. But that sense of routine is so critical, right? Maybe it's morning, afternoon, evening, and nighttime. What do you do? What is part of that routine? Building that routine, it gives a sense of safety. In many ways, it's like really young kids, right? Is that they need a routine. They need to know when their bedtime is. They need to know when they get up. They need to know, right, typically when dinner time is, lunchtime, breakfast time, stuff like that. So it's important that they know those things. And having that routine adds a sense of safety. And one of those big issues for a lot of folks with BPD is that they don't have that sense of safety. They're seeking safety. So it's so important to add that routine. Now next, this is really important. So for all the mental health providers out there, it's so important to have a treatment trajectory. Working with personality disorders, is so important to plan the course of treatment. It's very different than clients who don't have personality disorders, who may come in with a lot of continuous content, with content that seems to have, you know, this not necessarily repetitive nature because all, all therapeutic content is thematic in a lot of ways, but I think that they come in and they're more self-directed. I think that folks with BPD in particular and other personality disorders, it's hard for them to be directive. 
Now, that doesn't mean they're not demonstrative at times. Certainly they are, right? Or they're not demanding at times. Certainly they may be. But it's important to recognize, though, that having that treatment trajectory, here's what we're working toward. We're working for A, B, C, and you have to apply and recognize those metrics of growth because it can be really powerful for individuals with BPD to recognize that they're growing, to be encouraged that they're moving forward, to be empowered to instead of falling back on those old destructive maladaptive patterns, and even though they're safe and even though in many ways they're so, so negative, but they're used to it. So these adaptive and healthy strategies that we want to encourage that many ways, you know, they're very new to them. So when they do utilize them and we see that there's growth, we have to point it out. We have to be those cheerleaders. We have to encourage. And then what we want to do is, is have that become internalized in the individual's BPD so that then they can utilize that. They become their own cheerleader. They become their own sort of, you know, um, intensive, positive force that helps them grow beyond their BPD. And it is possible. Research shows that 80% of individuals with BPD experience remission of symptoms. It's interesting that there's not a lot of, whether it's universities or schools or, or other um, mental health professionals who are aware of that statistic. And many people, individuals with BPD, aren't aware of that statistic either. But it's so true. And I've seen it in my clients that they do hit these remissions and they do have great successes and they do grow to manage and control all of these maladaptive patterns that make up BPD. And it is so, so possible. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed the tips. Um, please, uh, you know, shoot me an email or let me know if you utilize them and if they're helpful for you, that would be great. And I wish you all the best. Please take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.